Okay, many of you have asked me about my teaching style or teaching philosophy and um, how, I've, how it has evolved over the years, or changed over the years. So I thought I'd give this uh, brief little talk about uh, my style of teaching. Um, my teaching philosophy has evolved considerably over the years. When I first began teaching li Japanese literature uh, at a certain Jesuit university in uh, Tokyo in 2010, my lectures were filled with copious information and facts. I believed that I believed then that the instructor's duty was to provide students with the full picture of everything: the historical context, the literary context, the author's biography, and even my own original interpretation of the text. I soon realized, however, that much of what I was doing was unnecessary and that my approach was in fact counterproductive. It was inhibiting students from formulating their own ideas, not to mention causing information overload. What is most important in a literature class, I discovered, is that students learn to read attentively and critically, learn to formulate their own ideas in a clear and cogent essay with a strong thesis and supporting evidence, and learn to enjoy reading so that they continue to read throughout their lives. And this is important, especially in our age of Wikipedia, where um, all the background information, historical information, and uh, just raw information can be found online. So the, the point of teaching literature and the arts and humanities in general these days is not just to give an overview of Wikipedia-ish uh, information. It's to uh, provide the framework in which students can think and analyze and interpret. Interpret's a, a key word, too, because interpretation is... One of the things that uh, Wikipedia and encyclopedias cannot do, right? So it's the student's task to learn how to interpret, I think, and analyze. Uh, my teaching approach thus shifted from a maximalist approach, which sought to give the students everything, to a more modest approach, which sought to give students a basic framework for engaging the literary texts. As I developed my new approach, I began making, stu student making study guides for each assigned readings reading. And many of you have already seen these study guides. Many of them are posted on my blog and they are uh, sort of, they give students a basic framework for thinking about these texts. Um, for each assigned reading. To date, I have created over a hundred study guides for various works of pre-modern, early modern, I should have medieval in there as well, pre-modern, medieval, early modern, modern, and contemporary works of Japanese literature. Among the authors included are pre-modern authors, uh, the Chinese poet, so occasionally we delve into Chinese poetry, of course, because Chinese classical poetry is the source of much of uh, classical Japanese literature, um, and medieval Japanese literature, and early modern Japanese literature as well. So we read uh, poems such as Cheng uh, Hanga by Bai Jiaoyi, which we've already read in this class this semester, I have um, study guides for Murasaki Shikibu, for Yoshida Kenko and his uh, Tsure Tsure Gusa, for Kamono Chome, especially his Hojoki. Um, medieval authors I've begun to add to the list of study guides. We've done a few of those this semester. Uh, early modern authors such as Matsuo Basho and Yosabu Song, uh, Chikamatsu Monzaimon, the dramatist that we've read this semester, Taminaga Shunsei. Uh, and then modern authors. And my, since my specialty is modern Japanese literature, namely Japanese literature after uh, the Meiji Restoration, the, Meiji, the beginning of the Meiji period, uh, we have lots of study guides of works by Akutagawa Ryunosuke, Nagai Kafu, Kawabata Yasunari, Sakaguchi Ango, Dazai Osamu, Koda Rohan, Izumi Kyoka, Natsume Soseki, Tayama Katai, Hagiwara Sakutaro, Edoga Lampo, Kaji Motojiro, Hayashi Fumiko, Taizaki Junichiro, Mori Ogai, Ishika Jun, and so forth. And contemporary authors, although contemporary Japanese literature is not my main interest or uh, specialty, we occasionally uh, do works by um, Takahashi Genichiro. These are all writers that are, who are still living. Tawada Yoko, Matsuda Aoko, Kanai Mieko, uh, Furukawa Hideo. Kanai Mieko's Usagi, by the way, Rabbits, is always is a perennial favorite among students, I should ask. It's a very grotesque and shocking work, but students like that kind of stuff these days. Furukawa Hideo, Kawakami Mieko, Murakami Haruki. And occasionally we do film as well, so we'll watch a film by Mizu, Mizoguchi Kenji. 
and Kurosa or Kurosawa Akira, the two greats um, among the two great uh, directors of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, these study guides that I make contain essential background information, so the kind of Wikipedia-esque stuff, definitions of relevant literary terms and concepts. So a lot of times these are not uh, things that uh, typical encyclopedias give, these uh, relevant literary terms. These are stuff that you have, to, you have to read the text, analyze it, interpret it, and make connections with relevant literary terms and concepts along with a dozen or so questions which, if considered carefully, lead the students inexorably to the truth of each work, or the essence of each work. And I like to use this term, the truth or the essence of each And what exactly is the truth of the text? Uh, and students often ask me, what, is, uh, what qualifies as a good essay or, uh, on a literary work or artistic work? And my answer is always the same. A reading of a work is successful to the degree that it locates and clarifies and elucidates a vantage point from which the truth of the text is revealed. And what is the truth of the text? Um, literary texts invariably in contain all kinds of ambiguities and aporias and contradictions and so forth. And so, in my view, the truth of the text is that standpoint from which all of those apparent aporias and contradictions and inconsistencies and so forth are resolved, right? So, for example, I had a student a few years ago read Kanai Mieko's Usagi, and there are all kinds of um, aporias and ambiguities and so forth and inconsistencies in the text if read from a normal uh, or the conventional standpoint. But I had a student in one essay locate the vantage point from which all of those are resolved. And she explained how all the incons apparent inconsistencies of the work can be resolved if viewed from vantage point X, which she explained in her paper. It was a very brilliant paper. And um, that's sort of what I uh, encourage writers to aim for when they write their papers. And regarding these uh, study guides that I make and give to the students and uh, in order for them to have a framework into which, in which they start thinking about the text. I've put these all together and I have a, uh, I'm scheduled to publish these study guides into a textbook uh, which will be published next year uh, by the publishing uh, house or publishing company at my university, Nagoya University of Foreign Studies, uh, under the title Reading Japanese Literature uh, in the Original and in Translation or something like that. We don't have a title yet but um, it should be published as a textbook for both Japanese students and foreign students uh, and it should come out next year in the spring. All right. well, so while, uh, while my lectures are no longer as elaborate as they were when I began teaching, they are still an integral part of my literature classes. The primary purpose of my lectures is to set the parameters for thought, to give students the basic background knowledge needed to formulate their own interpretations and analyses, and to introduce the relevant literary terms and concepts which will enable them to develop their own ideas and articulate them in a uh, sophisticated way. Many of the literary terms I use in my class come from narratology. And this is just a brief aside here. But um, I actually began my studies uh, in as an undergrad as a music major. And I studied music theory, piano performance, and so forth for the first two years. And then I switched to literature, I think, in year three. And what I found uh, initially, my initial impression was that music, musicology and music theory and so forth, seemed to be very rigorous, right? There was sort of a science or a mathematics behind it. And in my mu music theory class, we analyzed in a sort of mathematical way uh, music theory as it had developed from the uh, pre-classical period, pre-Baroque period, all the way through uh, Wagner. I think we got up through Wagner. And then I switched to literature. And I found that it didn't really have the same kind of rigor, the same science, scientific quality that music theory had. And I, um, you learn all kinds of literary theories, of course, but a lot of them are sort of tangential, 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 or um, sort of uh, not really directly relevant to the text, until I found narratology, right? And I think I came ac across a book about narratology in my uh, graduate studies, an introduction to narratology published by Cambridge Press, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was extremely helpful. And it was the closest thing to sort of a science of analyzing uh, prose literary texts that I had come across. And of course, in 
poetry it's very different. Poetry is closer to music and therefore it has its own prosody or system of analyzing text that, was, that resembled what I had done in my music theory classes. But prose, however, seemed to be a little uh, unrigorous uh, in terms of the theory about it until I got to narratology. So I found this very helpful as, an, uh, as a graduate student and I try to introduce these in very important terms in my classes as well. All right, so what are the main terms that I use? Focalization, point, focalization, point of view, which are similar but very different, and I always emphasize these. So by the end of the semester, students are very familiar with these two terms, focalization, or shoten in Japanese, and point of view, or sten in Japanese, the katarite no sten in Japanese. Other terms, diegesis, interior monologue, in Japanese, that would be, what, naimen dokohaku, which is a very important term that students always learn. Intertextuality, in Japanese, kantekisu se, show or tell, right, the difference between showing and telling, right? Showing is sort of to present uh, more conversations and dialogues and sort of dramatic sections in your work of prose, in your novel or short story, whereas telling is just more straightforward, direct uh, statements and descriptions from the uh, narrator, right? So I make sure that students are aware of this distinction between showing and telling. Flashbacks and flash forwards, right? So you always want to pay attention to whether the text progresses uh, chronologically or whether it jumps back and forth in time with all kinds of flashbacks and flash forwards and so forth. And there are fancier terms for these two words, but uh, I don't have them here. Um, metalepsis, right, is another one that we discuss, which is sort of the breaking of the third, breaking of the fourth wall, rather. Uh, Self-conscious narrator, so is the narrator, whether first person or third person, aware of the fact that he is narrating? And if so, uh, he, is a self, he or she is a self-conscious narrator which is an important work uh, term, literary term, especially in the context of 20th century modernist literature. Octagar Ryunosuke, for example, em employs a self-conscious narrator in his short story Negi, or The Green Onions, and so forth. In my view, narratology is the bedrock of literary studies, just as music theory is the bed bedrock of musicology. When relevant, I also introduce terms and concepts from other fields, such as psychoanalysis, sociology, philosophy, linguistics, and subfields such as post-colonial theory, cultural theory, uh, gender theory, and so forth, and queer theory. I don't think I've ever uh, talked about queer theory in class, but it might be relevant at some point. However, in my classes, as in my book, the emphasis is always, as in my book on Ishikawa Jung, uh, which is uh, nearing completion right now, the emphasis is always placed on close analysis of the text, rather than on the various external issues surrounding it. <clears throat> um, another brief aside, there seems to be a tendency in literary studies over the last 30 or 40 years to uh, avoid the text and avoid talking about the text specifically and to talk about everything around it, but never get to the essence of the text. And that's sort of a um, trend that I'm rebelling against, I guess you could say, uh, in my writings and in my classes. So I want students to <coughs> analyze the text closely, not just talk about the stuff you would find on Wikipedia, about the historical background and so forth. And the trend is in that direction, right? So a lot of times you read literary studies of the last 30 years and the, the truth of the text, the essence of the text is not really revealed and you're left uh, unsatisfied. <coughs> the reader's left unsatisfied. My students seem to appreciate this approach in my teaching evaluations of the... <laughs> all right, no need to brag here. Um, I often hear from other literature professors here in Japan and elsewhere that it is hard to get students to do the assigned readings before class. I've never understood this complaint or encountered this problem. In my experience, the vast majority of my students uh, have come to class having read the assigned texts. Right? So this is a complaint you hear, especially in Japan, that students don't read. You, you, shouldn't assign uh, works of literature because students don't read, they don't come prepared, they don't know how to read. And most of this is BS, I think, this complaint that you often hear from, especially older uh, generation of, t of university professors. Um, in my students have come to class with me, I suspect this is not due to any special affection for me. So it's not that they love me, my students like me, that they read the text and come prepared, but rather because the texts I assign are invariably stimulating, thought-provoking, 
and relevant to their lives. Right? So students sense that there's a dearth of uh, sort of substantial, uh, authentic, sort of serious uh, literature and readings and humanities studies kind of stuff in their classes and universities these days. So when they're given a chance to delve into it, to jump into it, they usually relish the opportunity. Um, relative to lives. It also helps that I employ a certain pedagogo pedagogical, pedagogical trick which ensures that students come to class prepared. And here's my trick. When students are required to read a certain literary work by, say, next Monday, at the beginning of Monday's class, I will ask students to put their heads down on the desk. Then I ask them, to, I ask them ten simple, true, or false questions about the plot. If the answer to my question is true, students hold up one finger. If the answer is false, students hold up two fingers. This short activity allows me to verify in just a few minutes which students have read the work and which have not. Once students have become accustomed to this routine, they rarely, if ever, come to class unprepared. Making sure students have done the assigned readings is absolutely essential for maintaining quality group discussions, which along with my lectures are an integral part of the class. So there's long been a kind of trend in Japan and universities uh, among literature professors to just talk uh, for 90 minutes about the work that students have not yet read, right? So when I came to Japan first, I think I took a few classes at Waseda University, just sat in on a few undergrad classes, and there were about 50 kids in the students, and the teacher was an expert in uh, Miyazawa Kenji, I think, and he would just talk uh, endlessly uh, for 90 minutes straight about poems and, or uh, other works by Miyazawa or other poets uh, that the students had not read and nobody would uh, listen during the class. They would all tune out, most of them would fall asleep and it was completely, it was a total waste of time and absolutely useless. And this is, trend still continues I think to this day, so a lot of the older professors will give a lecture on say, uh, whatever, a uh, work by Moriyogai for example, a novel, for 90 minutes and not assign the, the work or assume that the students are incapable of reading it. And it just bores the death out of everyone. It's a completely useless activity. Right? So uh, the students having to deal with the text by themselves, read it, come to class prepared, is absolutely essential for maintaining quality group discussion, which are, in my classes, an integral part, as I just said. All right, so getting students to read and interpret literary texts is, of course, only half the struggle. The instructor must also teach students how to articulate their thoughts in clear and cogent writing. In general, I require students to submit two essays per semester. Since I assign 10 to 15 literary works per semester, from pre-modern all the way through uh, modern or contemporary Japan, uh, students must choose from these two works on which to write their two essays. This alone, however, is not enough to ensure that students will become proficient at writing academic essays. Therefore, in addition to the two assigned essays, I also require, uh, I require students to submit one short essay outline for each assigned text. So if we have 15 uh, literary texts assigned that semester, I will require them to uh, write one short essay outline. So they don't have to write the whole essay, they don't have to flesh it out, but they have to just come up with an idea for an essay about that particular text, come up with a thesis, a strong, bold thesis that sort of upturns the conventional thinking about that text, and then come up with evidence one, evidence two, evidence three, evidence four that supports that essay. And then they don't have to write the essay, they just have to have the short outline, uh, half a page, uh, usually. And somebody's at the door. All right, continuing, uh, the reason for this, for uh, my assigning one short essay outline for each of the assigned uh, readings, is that I have found that students often have trouble coming up with ideas for essays, especially in the beginning of the semester. They often do not know how to formulate a strong thesis, they don't, often don't know what a thesis, or shō in Japanese is, and how to construct an argument around that thesis. So it's assigning short essay outlines for each literary work helps to remedy this problem. So by uh, assignment seven or assignment eight, they're already used to it. So even if they're not taking the class, after they take the class, they're reading the text and thinking in the back of their mind, if I were to write an essay about this, what sort of thesis would I come up with? How would I uh, develop it? And so forth. So it becomes sort of automatic after a while. Uh, once students have written several such outlines, which must contain a strong and original thesis sentence that challenges prevailing opinion or debunks obvious interpretations, 
uh, students come to understand what academic writing entails and are ready to flesh out a proper essay. Okay? And the thesis sentence is always one sentence I, I recommend. Right? So, in general, the work is understood in this way. However, uh, it can also be understood from this important way, and it should be understood from this important way. And in this essay, I will uh, show why this is so, get, citing evidence one, two, three, four, and five, period, is the sort of uh, formula that I uh, advise them to write. Uh, by semester's end, my students will have written ten short essay outlines, at least ten, with a clear and strong thesis and supporting evidence for each of the ten or more assigned texts. And then we'll also have submitted two full essays with citations and bibliographies and so forth. And this is another difference between Japan and, um, and the U.S. I, I'm most familiar with the U.S. since I grew up there. But uh, in high school, we all learned how to write an essay, right? The standard formula with citations, bibliographies, and so forth, the, the normal structure of the thesis, evidence, 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 and then the concluding paragraph that repeats the first paragraph, basically. But Japanese have not had that for some reason. I don't know why it is. But uh, even at the elite schools, they have not had it. Very few are able to write uh, essays when they come into freshman year. Most of them end up writing consobum, or just sort of, subjective impressions about something with a lot of feely, touchy-feely words about how they felt, how they reacted to certain texts without any thesis, without any direction in the essay. So this is something that has to be remedied from day one. All right. I realize that many students today can... F okay, we can skip that part. I don't need to read that. Uh, just which, that I should say, though, that I don't require... Since everybody's poor these days, nobody has any money, I don't require students to buy uh, textbooks, maybe one at most, although I, I, I might require them to uh, purchase my textbooks that's coming out next year, but so far I've uh, rarely had them buy books. I think I had them buy a few paper books back when I was teaching at a, at a certain Jesuit university in Tokyo, but um, recently I have PDFs of all the short stories or poems or plays or whatever that are needed for my class, both the original Japanese and the uh, tr English translations. So depending on what the w focus of the class is, I will just distribute those through Moodle or whatever system the university uses so that the students can download those and print them on their own and then write their notes into those uh, documents and bring them to class. All right, in order to... Okay, in, in the form of PDF files. This distribution method makes it easy for students to print, read, and bring to class the works. It saves them the trouble of having to prepare thousands of pages of copies for in-class distribution. In the beginning, I didn't know about this trick, so I would make uh, copies of everything for the students and do it all myself as a kind of service to the students. It would take hours to do and to organize everything, and it would just end up giving me a huge headache, uh, especially in Japan where uh, you're required to teach uh, seven classes per week. Six or seven is the usual standard. I teach seven right now at the moment. Students understand that these, are, okay, yeah, they understand that these PDFs are not to be distributed outside of class and so forth. Over the years, okay. Lastly, I always adjust the amount of Japanese used in class according to the abilities and needs of my students or to, the, or to whether they are Japanese students or foreign students. To date, I have taught three types of Japanese literature classes, those entirely in Japanese, using the original texts only, those entirely in English, using English translations only, for example, for my foreign exchange students, and those in both English and Japanese, using uh, both the originals and translations. If students are fairly fluent in Japanese or highly motivated, I will assign both the original Japanese texts along with the original translations. If I should if foreign exchange students are fairly fluent or motivated, I will assign both. When that is not possible, we read the works only in English. For classes with advanced students, we sometimes read the text solely in Japanese, and uh, many of my classes with Japanese students only, um, we read only the original Japanese. In addition to... okay, all right, that's the end of this short description of my... Um, philosophy of teaching literature in universities today. If you have any questions, leave uh, your questions or comments, leave them below in the comments and subscribe to my channel. Goodbye.